My precious, precious grandson, I brought me. What are you doing here, huh? Grandpa, it's yes. late. You need late. to... Late? <laughs> you know, it's many, many, many years too late. How could I go to sleep when we're all in mourning right now? Here in the water, brought me. Please, come, take a seat. Do you remember what today is? How could I forget? It's Tishabov. Today we mourn for the destruction of the temple, right? Yes, yes, yes. Is there something wrong with me, Grandpa? Why don't I feel anything? Oh, why you don't feel anything? You have too many distractions. But that's the reason why we have this special day, to be able to uh, get our feelings to feel the mourning. Okay, but seriously, Grandpa, how can I feel mourning for a loss I never had to begin with? How can I yearn for a life I never lived? Hmm, very interesting question. You know, let me tell you something, Avromi. You see, the story with the destruction of the base of English is not just a story that happened over 2,000 years ago. It's something that is relevant right now. When the fire was burning, so it was not just wood and stones that were burning. It was not the only thing that was destroyed. We were the greatest nation in the world. And then we lost our status to be the greatest nation when that happened. When we were sent into Goas, into exile, then all the anti-Semites, they started to show their terrible force against us. And many tragedies happened to us. You know something? I have a great idea. <clears throat> you know, I keep over here, I bring it every year by Tishabov. <coughs> it's a little dusty. It's a family diary. In it, many stories that happened to Jewish people throughout the generations is written in here. And from these stories, we can learn many things. If you just listen carefully, you'll try to visualize with your own eyes and feel the pain and suffering what the other Jewish people felt in their generations. But at the same time, you'll see that what they did and how they survived gives us courage and, and, and gives us strength we need to go on and on and keep our Judaism, our Yiddishkeit, very strong. Here, you know what? Let me open this up over here. <laughs> it was a little bit dusty, don't worry. <coughs> okay, here. Okay. Let me read from the first story. <laughs> we hear hoofbeats in the distance as dread fills our hearts. The yelling and screaming of the crusaders, they are on their way. We've heard about those crazed people en route to the Holy Land to take over Yerushalayim. They're angry, stubborn, and out to slaughter. The Jews here in France are scared. We begged the Jewish communities nearby, our brethren in Germany, to pray for our survival. They're at risk too. We'll need all the prayers that we can get. We know how it was in the First Crusade. It's happened before to communities throughout Western Europe. The Crusaders came and massacred families from old to young just because they were Jewish. To the Crusaders, we are heretics, those that go against their religion. Why wait until they reach Jerusalem, our holy city? when they can kill their neighbors right here in France. We are the first stop on their killing rampage, and I'm so scared. So we're here now, our entire family trembling, hiding in the cellar that Papa made just for this reason. It's cold and dark down here, and we've been sitting cramped for hours. Our entire family, no, our entire community can be wiped out. And even if they pass us up, they'll loot our land, come into our homes, and take whatever they want. They're out to destroy, to ruin our property, our families, and our lives. We can hide, but they know we're here. They'll find us. We are trying to feel secure. Mama's encouraging us with songs of hope, songs of trust that everything Hashem does is for the best. Keep 
down, we all know that no matter where we go, whatever is supposed to happen, will happen. Such a longing I feel for the Vesa Mikdash to live in peace with Hashem's hand clearly guiding us, to live like a Jew and be proud of who we are with no fears of anti-Semitism. Will we survive this madness? Will we come out of here alive? Scarred but alive? There will be funerals tomorrow. We can only hope we'll be so lucky as to attend. We don't know what will be, but whoever knows, yes, it's hard to sit here in suspense with a terrible future ahead of us. But right now, I'm sitting with Mama and Papa and all the children. I don't know what will happen to our family today. But even so, amidst the darkness, I can still feel Hashem's closeness. So I'm trusting in Him, and that brings me comfort to go on. <sighs> wow. Shimon must have been right about my age, but showed so much strength, so much faith. What happened to him? Did he survive? Well, to tell you the truth, I really don't know. But unfortunately, what I could tell you is, in that time period during the Crusades, many Jewish people lost their lives. Men, women, children, even little babies. But you know something? Despite the Crusaders' best efforts to try to wipe us out, they did not succeed. Do you know that? We're still here. Wasn't there anything they could do to save themselves? No, no, I'm afraid not. You see, in that time period, we were just being killed simply because we were Jews. Do you understand? They did give us a choice, really, but it wasn't such a good choice. You see, they gave us a choice that if we want to live, we just have to convert. But if we don't want to convert and we want to stay as a Jew that keeps Torah and, and, and our Judaism, then hey, we lose our lives and they would slaughter us. But Grandpa... It doesn't make any sense to me. Why wouldn't they want to live? <laughs> you think for a moment that they didn't want to live? Of course they wanted to live. But what kind of life is it to live a life without Torah, without Judaism? You know, this is not a life. You know, uh, people were put many times through this uh, feeling of, of having to make this very hard decision to give up their lives and, and to stay a Jew till the very end or to give up uh, Torah. But you know, I just thought of something. Inside my diary, there's a very interesting story with the Ben Shushan brothers, where they were put to a similar situation where they had to make a decision. You know what? Here, come. Let me show you this story. Come, listen. <laughs> brothers trade business well known throughout Spain for its import of expensive silks, spices and other exotic items. Jacob and Ruben Ben Shushan inherited the business from their father who in his old age along with his wife Donna Raquel received a metal from the King of Spain for their great service to the country. Jacob and his wife welcomed twin girls, Isabella and Esther, to their family one Hanukkah. Mazel tov, mazel tov. Oh, yes, indeed. And exactly one year later, Ruben's wife had a baby girl, Sarah. Mazel tov, mazel tov. Every Hanukkah, the three girls celebrated their birthdays together. Oh, what a happy time it was. The girls grew up in freedom and bliss.
a special Jewish spade. Fanatical priests incited the crowds against the Jews and tried to force them by means of torture and persecution to convert to Christianity. The church was successful to a degree. To a degree, yes indeed. Many wealthy Jews, the rich ones, could not withstand the pressure of having to give up their property and went through the motion of conversion. Though, they outwardly, and I say that again, outwardly, they lived like Christians. But inside, they remained faithful to their beliefs and secretly kept the laws of the Torah as best as they could. These pretend converts were called and known as Marathos. The Ben Shushan family was one of the few very brave ones who remained proud Jews despite the danger that they faced every day. They risked their lives countless times in their effort to help their fellow Marathos. Approximately five years passed and the situation in Spain became one of terror and of dread. The secret Jews, living with the constant fear of being betrayed to the church, always suspicious of one another, as no one really knew who was a friend and who was a foe. When the three Ben Shushan girls reached their eighth birthday, Grandma and Raquel presented each one of them with an exquisite necklace in the shape of a menorah. She told them the story of Hanukkah, elaborating on the strength of character the Jews showed at a time when the Greeks were trying hard to tear at the very soul of our nation. Why did it horror as she told of Antiochus? Antiochus's cruelty had turned to war as she described the greatness of Hannah and her seven sons. Yes, each one of them refused to bow down to the king's idol. Yes, with tears in her eyes, grandma how each son was killed before Hannah's eyes. Down to the youngest son, the ear was very heavy in the Ben Shushan home. Everyone understood what Grandma was trying to say. Jacob arrived home just in time to hear the youngest son's refusal bow to the idol, interrupted. Uh, it's Hanukkah, a joyous holiday. Come, let us celebrate with a game of dreidel. After the game began, a knock rang out. Framed in the doorway stood a strange man. The Grand Inquisitor himself, Thomas D. Torquemada. The most wicked, the most powerful, and the most evil man in Spain. Yes, Reuben and Jacob and Shusha. Both of them, they were arrested. They were arrested. Their crime? What was it? Inspiring the Jews to resist conversion. Turkamada felt as these two were influential leaders of the Jewish community. Turkamada wanted them to be an example to the community. Besides pressuring them to convert, he wanted and not only did he want it, he demanded it that they inform Arthur Marathas, who were still
still practicing their Judaism in secret. Weeks passed by, and the torches that Reuben and Jacob had to endure were unbearable, but their resolve did not weaken, not one drop. Unfortunately, Reuben's body, frail and weakened from the starvation and brutal treatment, finally succumbed and he died in the cell of the church prison. After his death, Grandma Raquel tried to smuggle her three precious granddaughters to safety, but they were not quick enough. The arm of the church was very long and hot on their trail. Only Isabella and Sarah managed to escape. Esther was caught and forcefully taken to the dark dungeons of the prison cells. Thomas D. Torquemada, that wicked evil person, threw the little girl into her father's cell and screamed out, Maybe now, Jacob Ben Shushan, you will finally see that it is not worth fighting us. If you still refuse to cooperate with us, we will kill your daughter right in front of your eyes. <laughs> Father and daughter hugged and cried for a few minutes. Nothing else mattered in the world. Jacob bent down and looked at Esther with tears cascading down his cheeks. He spoke softly, yet firmly. My dearest daughter, do you remember the story Grandma told you of Hannah? and those seven sons. No matter what happens, don't ever, don't ever give up. Don't ever give up who you are. We are the chosen people. We are royalty. And even though right now, it seems like the whole world is out to break us, it's only temporary. It's only a test to make us become His body scarred from the Inquisition's tortures. Then she looked down at her little menorah, hugging her father tight, and she said, I promise, Papa, I will be like the seven sons. I won't forget. I won't forget. At that moment, Thomas D. Turkamata, the wicked, terrible Russia that he was, knew he was defeated. Yes, the Jewish father and daughter were in the physical grasps. But though he may have won the battle, they, they had lost the war. The Ben Shushan family did survive through a series of incredible miracles. When I say miracles, I mean real and strong noticeable miracles that Jacob and his daughter were finally reunited with Grandma and the other two girls across the border in Amsterdam. Their devotion and commitment to their faith remain in the family until today. Wow, Grandpa, this story is unbelievable. Yes, yes. As you can see from the stories that I told you so far, we Jews are eternal. Do you understand? We are eternal. We live on. But now, take a look at everybody else. For a moment, let's uh, take a look at Spain, the golden era. They had so much wealth and everything. But where are they now? A small nothing. And yet, the greatest empire, the Roman Empire, 
At that time period, everyone was under the influence of the Romans. Everybody. But now where are they today? Today, it's ancient ruins. That's how you just see ancient ruins. But we Jews, we are eternal. We live on and on. We have beautiful communities today. I just can't imagine the suffering they went through, Grandpa. I would never have the strength to withstand it. Ah, you may feel that right now, Avrumi, but you know something? Inside you and every single Jew, there's e e an, an eternal strength that we all possess of a Jew. And when the time comes, even a person your age, a Jewish child like you, will be able to face such a terrible dilemma and be able to face it with strong, courageous courage. I'm telling you, let me tell you, in Russia, many years ago, there were children just like you, and even younger, who were uh, taken to become uh, Cantonists. You know what Cantonists are, ah, yes? I'm starting to see there's a lot I don't know about our history. Ah, apparently so. Yes. Okay, so let me fill you in a little bit. It was around 1812, and... Uh, the Russians, the Tsar, he set up the Cantonists, you know, but a little bit different than the earlier Tsars. He took Jewish children. He had children snatched away from their parents as young as five years old. And they were taken and brought in to start training in the Russian army for 25 years. 25 years? Yes, you heard me correctly. 25 years. And you know, during that time, some Jewish children didn't survive physically, and many of them that did survive, spiritually, they were lost to our nation. So the Tsar succeeded in his plan? Yes, to a certain extent he succeeded, but I want you to know that the tears of the mothers who were crying and the young, innocent Cantonists, their tears reached up to the heavens, mm. are now... They are a protection for our future generations. The year was 1812. Russia and Ukraine were under the powerful hand of the famed Tsar, who ruled the land with tyrannical power. It was just last week that the boys had been seized forcibly from their mother's arms by the Khatris. Yes, the government kidnappers, also known as the Snatchers. And they were handed over to the military, where they would spend the next 25 years in an environment of godlessness and brutality. Yanko and Chaimo were playing outside when the Chapa came to get them. Tears flooded the streets. Everyone knew what the fate of these Cantonists would be. More than half of these boys would never even reach the age of 20. The training Beatings by the commander, lack of a mother's love and support, and skimpy army rations. This would kill the young children, even for those few that somehow survived. Physically, that is, well, their entrance into the Cantonist army signified the end their spiritual lives. They were forced to convert and with but a few years of Jewish schooling and years ahead in the army, the boys didn't stand a chance to stay true to their faith. Years went by and they were constantly forced by the Russian soldiers you over there! What are you sleeping over there? Wake up! Stand up and I talk to you! They would 
shout. Stand at attention. Why you shout? Why aren't you working? Pick up that heavy load. Do you understand what I'm talking to you? One day, Yankel remembered that according to his calculations, it was Purim. It was Yudal Anna, the holiday of Purim. At that time, Yankel was 15 years old. He got up and he begged the others, please listen to me. Tonight is Purim. And while we can't give each other Mishloach Manas, and, and we don't have a Megillah to read the story of the holiday, there is something we can do, just like the Jews fasted and prayed in the story of Purim and were saved. We can pray too. Then he asked, Does anyone remember the words of Davening? The boys, looking back at him, solemnly shook their heads. Anyone knows something we can say, something we can daven, so we can save ourselves from this situation. It was a painful moment as all the children realized they had nothing to say, nothing to pray, nothing to give themselves any hope. There was nothing, nothing that they could do to comfort themselves. Then one boy piped up and said, Mom, I don't know any to know him by heart. But, but I remember the tune um, we used to sing when, when we all sat to him together. Um, I, um, I think the tune goes something like na 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 They all chimed in. And the more they got into it, soon they broke out into a dance. But all the while chanting the melody that remembered from the Tehillim. They didn't know the Megillah by heart. They couldn't doubt it. Nor could they fast or pray. It was the humming of the children that erased the name of Haman, the enemy that oppressed them and had brought them into this place in a way that the greatest reading of the Megillah could never have done. They were overcoming the decree of their oppressors. It was Purim! And there were no celebrations, but one thing was for sure. The name of Haman was certainly erased. It's scary to think how much hatred they have for us. Yes, it is. Yes, it is, unfortunately. But you know... If not for the fact that Hashem always protected us, we would never be able to outlive our enemies. It's not possible. Tell me, Avrami, did you ever hear of the blood libels? I don't think so. What's a blood libel? Ah. Well, let me tell you. One of the first blood libels started out around 1171. It was in France. There was a... French peasant, you know, he claimed that he saw a Jew, you know, kill a child and throw the child into the river. But you know, not one piece of evidence was found. Nothing. They didn't even find the body. No corpse, no nothing. And you know what? Despite that, 51 Jews lost their lives. They were murdered, tortured even before they were murdered, just for a crime that never happened. How can they get away with such injustice? Wasn't there any law and order? <laughs> law and order in those days? Come, let me tell you another story and you'll see what kind of law and order there was in those days. Lord Jeffrey was jealous of Ram Abram the owner of the neighboring estate. Rebabram 
was smarter, wealthier, and more talented than Lord Jeffrey. Not only that, but the entire community of Norwich, England, both Jews and non-Jews alike, knew how influential Rev. Abram was. What everyone didn't know was how far Lord Jeffrey's jealousy and hatred would take him. You've killed my daughter, Lord Jeffrey yelled as he led the mob to surround the house of Rev. Abram. You've killed her, and you've used her blood for your matcha for Passover. Don't deny it. We know it. Why would anyone use blood for matzah? It really is ridiculous, because we Jews are not allowed to drink blood. You know that. But they would do anything, even kill their own children. As Lord Jeffrey, he killed his own daughter just to frame the Jews, just to make trouble. The mob surged forward and broke down the door. They climbed inside the house and dragged out of them. I take him out, I bring him out, I yeah, bring him out, I bring him Chase me, grab him, I got him. Yeah, okay, hey, <laughs> you can't get away this time. Yeah, we got him. They beat him and they pulled him through the streets to the town jail to await his fate. The entire town's long repressed hatred towards the Jews was now outright and apparent as no authority would take responsibility for the bloodline. Reb Avram's trial was held on a Friday. A week after his arrest, Reb Avram weakened by his lack of food and pale from his future verdict. Lord Jeffrey stated his case. My daughter! He paused to insert a dramatic song. <laughs> has been found dead in the forest, and a bloody knife was found in this man's home. He spat out. The judge's verdict rang out. Guilty! 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 Uh, but you haven't given him a chance to speak. He's the most kind and gentleman I know. Uh, he wouldn't hurt a fly, let alone a child, protested Reb Herschel and others. The judge was unmoved. To the gallows! Take him to the gallows! Reb Abram was dragged away to be killed. As his wife and children watched helplessly, their heart-rending screams. <laughs> piercing the empty blackness, enveloping the community. Such accusations were hurled at the Jews time and time again through long decades in England and Western Europe. Many young Gentile children were killed just to blame the Jews and incite the peasants to take revenge against their innocent neighboring Jews. Sometimes, the accusations came with no evidence at all. But who would stand up against the mob? Who could control such ruffian anger? The police. They were anti-Semites themselves. They chose to ignore the pleas and cries for help. Never quite sure when the next tragedy would strike. The Jews no longer could feel safe they walk the streets. It feels so real. Their helplessness and loneliness. I feel so spoiled, you know, Grandpa. Hearing all these stories makes all my hardships today seem so irrelevant. Ah, the things that you struggle with today are very similar to what they go through. Maybe a little bit of a different way. What do you mean? The torture those young boys went through? And to think they were my age? Now listen. When you stand up to something you believe in strongly enough that you're following the right pathway, what Hashem wants... But so many of them died after so much suffering. And they were alone, torn away from their families, with no support to keep them going. Ah, now you're starting to understand what it means to mourn and, and to feel a loss. Yes, we lost our glory, our glory. And therefore, we're still in this goals for a very long time. 
You know, they are oppressed and persecuted even until today. You always used to tell me of the war your parents lived through. I never really understood what it meant. Ah, yes, the Holocaust. This war took place uh, approximately 76 years ago. It's really not so long ago. There's something I've been meaning to ask you for a long time. Yes, what is it? How did they do it? How did they do what? How did they survive? They went through so much. The camps, digging graves, laying train tracks with their bare hands. What's their secret? Where did they get the willpower to remain alive? Very interesting question. You know, the people that survived the Holocaust, many of them survived only because of miracles. There's no other way. But you would not believe when you hear the story I'm going to tell you about Rabbi Yidel Wallace, you would never believe that so many miracles can happen to one person. <laughs> Yidel Wallace was sent to the Dachau concentration camp in the heart of Germany. Yidel had already been living under German rule for five years. Somehow managing to cheat death time and time again. One morning, Yidel witnessed a group of Jews being directed to their deaths, having outlived their usefulness. They were being sent the way of the millions who had already been killed. One of the passing Jews, perhaps knowing that these were the final moments on earth, chose to do a courageous act, catching Yidel's eye and communicating without speaking. The man removed a pouch containing a pair of tefillin from the sleeve of his striped pajamas and tossed it into Yidel's general direction, beseeching him with his eyes, with his eyes. He beseeched him to take good care of the legacy. Yidel was faced with a terrible choice. Hiding a pair of tefillin in the barracks was an act of rebellion, punishable by death. Yet, he couldn't bring himself to throw out a pair of tefillin. Shoving the tefillin beneath his shirt, he hid the tefillin in the barracks. When he rose the next morning, he made an impulsive decision to dog the tefillin. A priceless gift. It was the first time he had worn a pair of tefillin since 1939. This was a moment in life he would remember forever as he stood in the Dachau barracks, black boxes on his head. The door opened and a German officer entered. 
Within moments, he was arrested and dragged outside to the assembly of all the inmates where the Nazi soldiers surrounded him. Step up! They barked at him. Get up on the chair. A bar hung above the chair. There was a noose attached to the bar. Every inmate, every single inmate, will look at the punishment. If you look away, you will be shot. The men and women on both sides of the fence watched as the SS man slipped the noose around Yidl's neck. Eyes filled with horror, hearts filled with sorrow. Everyone waited for the moment to end. The German, standing next to the chair, held the Tefillin high up in the air. Do you see these boxes? This man used them. Well, that is why he is going to be put to death. No one moved. The silence was intense. If anyone else dares to try to use one of these such items, they will have the same ending. Jude, do you have any final requests before you are hanged? Do you? What did he ask for? Ah, what he asked for, listen carefully. It was a cruel type of joke. A farce. What could he possibly ask for when everything was taken away from him? But Yidl, he seized the opportunity. Yes, I have a request. I want to wrap myself in Trillin one last time. How spiritual of you, the Nazi sneered. We'll leave you hanging until tomorrow wearing the boxes and everyone will be standing around and they will understand why you were punished. As he wrapped the tefillin around his arm and his head, he recited the holy words every Jew says when donning the tefillin, declaring his love and his eternal commitment to his creator. I will be trust you to me forever, and I will be trust you to me with righteousness, justice, kindness, and mercy, and you shall know Hashem. He spoke the words slowly and deliberately, feeling every one of them more deeply than he had ever felt before. The words sent the chill up the collective spine of every prisoner that was standing there and heard this. And even though they heard these words countless times before, ah yes, a Jew connecting with his creator, even with the tip of the sword on his neck. Yidl looked at his fellow brothers and sisters and saw something he hadn't seen. In many months, tears were rolling down their emaciated cheeks. Yidin! 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 He cried out to them. Do you understand? I am the victor here. Can there be a greater revenge than this? Everyone held their breath. Get him off the tear! Get him off that chair! The Nazi officer screamed. You think that you are a winner? I'll kill you. How you're going to die? Not on top of the chair. No, no. That is too easy for you. No. You think you're such a hero? That's too easy for a hero like you. We will whip you. And we will whip you. Until you fall to your death. Then... We will see who the winner is. Yidl Wallace was beaten 25 lashes. He survived each blow. He wasn't dead. The Germans didn't win. His fellow inmates nursed him back to health 
hidden beneath the barracks. There they kept him until he was healed. He'll survive the war, a true champion. And he went on to build a family. No, the Germans did not succeed in wiping us out. We survived. After the war, many people asked Yidl how he survived, how he did it. What did he say? How did he stand up against those cruel, sadistic how, Nazis? How he stood up? What did he say? I'll tell you. He told everybody the following. He took one day at a time. What he did was every day, when he woke up in the morning, he looked up towards Hashem, and he said, Hashem, please give me one more day to live. I want to live one day. And then the next day, he would do the same thing. He would look again up to Hashem. He would look up to Hashem and say, Hashem, please give me another day. And the next day, and the next. And he did the same thing for six whole years. And that's how he survived. Wow, these people sound incredible. True heroes. I know this may sound a bit selfish, Grandpa. Yes? But I feel so happy that I was born in this generation, so I don't have to deal with the choices and horrors they had in the past. Let me tell you something. We are in Gaulus. We are still suffering. There's plenty of anti-Semitism here in America just as well. Everybody knows somebody or someone that is suffering something. And by the way, on another note, you should be aware that nowadays we have a different kind of battle that we fight also in this goals, in this exile. Spirituality. We have a spiritual battle. What types of choices do we face? Years ago, people felt more connected to Hashem because they had a strong uh, betochen, a trust, an amuna, a belief in Hashem. Nowadays, we have so many distractions that people don't feel the same connection. There's a, a problem. We have a spiritual battle that we fight every day nowadays. So how are we supposed to overcome and be strong? It's very simple, Avrami. First of all, you should be aware that we Jewish people, we have the tools and whatever we need to face these challenges. Do you understand? We have the Torah. We have our legacy. We have everything that we need. There's nothing missing by us. What will change when the Beit HaMikdash will be rebuilt? Everything. Everything's going to change. There won't be the illnesses and the sicknesses that you have nowadays. And people won't feel the distractions to pull them away from doing what Hashem wants in His Torah. Instead, people will do it their missions and they will fulfill everything without a problem. Grandpa, do you think we will survive to see that day? I mean, so many people, much greater than me, have yearned for it to come. What can I do? It's very simple also again. How? Well, when you do acts of kindness, you help someone else in need, or you give up something that you really want, but you realize it's wrong, and therefore you give this up. This is also strong. Avrami, every time you daven, every time you keep Shabbos, every time you keep any mitzvah, it's building another brick, putting down another brick. And with those things, we build the Beis Amigdash quicker. And yes, we could be Zoycher, will merit to see the redemption in our time. Hmm. Can I tell you a story now, Grandpa? You, Avrami, want to tell me a story? <laughs> I see, I taught you very well. <laughs> Go ahead, tell me a story. I'm going to sit back and relax. I'm going to listen. Go ahead. It happened on the first day of camp last summer. Yes, yes. I saw him standing off to the side with a sad look in his eye. I went over to introduce myself. I told him my name and he told me his. It was Marvin's first day at the zone. And aside from being his, his first time away from home, this is also his first Jewish experience, ever. Ooh, very interesting. He was unsure of how things would go, but to make matters worse, a terrible rainstorm had struck 
unexpectedly at Stamford, New York, a few hours prior to our arrival. All the luggage was immediately thrown into dry areas to protect it from the rain. Marvin could not locate his luggage. I was determined to help him find his luggage. I searched everywhere, and sure enough, I found it on the side of Nashville, the canteen cafeteria. He thanked me profusely and asked me a question that I will never forget. What was that question? He asked, why did you go out to help me, someone you just met? Why in the world would you go so out of your way to help someone you don't even know? I don't understand. And I answered him simply, and I told him, as a fellow Jew at the zone, you are my brother, and brothers help each other out. Marvin went on to have an amazing summer, and, as a matter of fact, he even went to yeshiva the following year. Fantastic! I don't think what I did was such a big deal. Can what do you mean? so small as that help to rebuild the Beit HaMikdash? You think? You think what you did was something so small? On the contrary, what you did was very big. Every single act of kindness will help bring the base of Mikdash here quicker and will help our final redemption come about. Of course it was a great thing you did. You know what? Listen. Come, let us go pray that this year Tisha B'Av should be turned into a joyous Yontif and next year we'll be celebrating in the third base of Mikdash. We're as the base of Mikdash gone I stand here all alone How long am I to wait for all my children So here we are, and Mashiach has not come yet. Beis HaMikdash was not built yet. And is it up to us to bring him and build the Beis HaMikdash? One could ask, how is that possible? All the great previous generations, with all the great Gedali Yisrael, Rashi, and Vilna Goyen, and Chavetz Chaim, they couldn't bring Mashiach. And Hashem expects us to bring Mashiach. We don't come to the greatness in any way, any stretch of the imagination. What can we do? A marshal is given of a big fat tree that had to be cut down. They called in all the strong people to chop it down. They lined up, gave them a very good axes. And each one gave a bang with his axe number one, number two, ten of them came, and the tree was still standing. But it had just a little bit left, a little bit more. And a person came along, a weakling, with a very dull axe, and he gave the final chop, and the tree came down. So, who really knocked the tree down? All the ten people from before, they knocked it down. The last one, he just, just did the final, the final touches to make it happen. Mashiach coming is a process. It's not up to one individual. Hashem has a, a, a whole uh, process in mind that has to be gone through in order to bring Mashiach. And all the great people from before, they prepared the way for Mashiach in their great way. And we, in the last generation, we're not as great as they are, but we have the power to make that last chap that last clap, that last important step in that process to bring Mashiach. 
So it's not we that's bringing him, in the full sense of the word, but it's the great people before us. We're just finishing up by God giving everybody a chance to be part of that process, to have the schus to be part of that process. It's like a elf, a dwarf on top of a giant. The giant is much taller, can see much more, but if he puts a dwarf on top of his shoulders, the dwarf can see more than the giant can see. Who's really making it happen? The giant underneath. But the dwarf on top is the one who's finishing off the process of seeing what has to be seen. And that's how we have to look at being a Mashiach. We're on top of the shoulders of giants, great people before us. And we're part of that process to finish off and do what we can do to finish off what they uh, did to make it happen. We also have another very important thought that's involved over here, that we are living now in the time, relatively one of the best times in Jewish history for the Jewish people, because we're very affluent, relatively speaking, especially in this country and most countries. Jews are having it relatively very good as far as their parnos is concerned, their livelihood, Nobody's starving. Nobody's really going hungry. Very little of that is going on now. And uh, the problem from uh, anti-Semitism actually suffering from is very little, basically, especially in this country. And things are going very well. A person to want Mashiach is uh, something uh, out of the ordinary. Why would a person want Mashiach? Everything's going so nicely, even as far as... uh, uh, Yiddish guy is concerned. The Judaism, we have a lot of shuls, we have Torahs thriving in all the cities in America and all around the world. We call them with yeshivas. Why would we want Mashiach? If we do want Mashiach, that shows we, we realize something's missing. Even though we're so affluent and so uh, 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 satisfied, so to speak, with what, our life. But we realize we're missing. It's something that we're being close to Hashem is what we're missing. Yeah, we have a, a affluence and, and, and a financially uh, a stability, financial stability, but we're missing that closeness to Hashem. We're missing that Ava and the, uh, uh, the, 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 the real purpose of creation for Yidin to be close, Jews to be close to Hashem, to have that great feeling of, of Ava Hashem and Kirvis Hashem, closeness to Hashem. The base Hamikdash, when it's built, it's It's like almost like the world to come. The world to come is the Jews will be close to Hashem. The base Hamikdash, the Jews are close to Hashem, and it's a different feeling. It's like feeling Yom Kippur, like Kol Nidre, like Neila, all year around. Who doesn't get a, a great feeling of of, uh, of 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 satisfaction, of 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 delight when it comes to the great times in our life that we feel Hashem close to Him? There's a great simcha or something which uh, we enjoy as a spiritual uh, uh, happening in our lives that we have a, a, a special uh, warmth and, 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 and a, 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 a warm simcha that, that we're feeling. And that's what the base Mektish is all about. Close to Hashem, being so happy to be uh, uh, near Him like Hashem wants us to be. So if we feel that now, and we say, of course, we are, we're affluent, we have everything we need, more or less, but we're missing this closeness to Hashem, this spiritual uplifting, spiritual pleasure that we're, that we're missing. Hashem is very, very touched, so to speak, with, with us, that if we feel that way. And uh, this is something which is, could go a long way to bring Mashiach, the schus that uh, we'll have in our generation, even though we're so... Uh, small compared to the generations before us. Let's hope that it'll be in our time. It should be very soon. This year, we'll do our best to pray, and the last time we'll sit on the floor to cry about Vaisa Mikdash, we should make Tisha a day of joy and a great holiday and a great Yom Tov.